DiscerningHearts.com, in cooperation with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, presents A Sister of St. Therese, Servant of God, Leone Martin, Bearer of Hope, with Father Timothy Gallagher. Father Gallagher is a member of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, a religious community dedicated to retreats and spiritual direction, according to the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. He is featured on several series found on the Eternal Word television network. He's also the author of numerous books on the spiritual teachings of St. Ignatius of Loyola and the Venerable Bruno Lanteri, founder of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, as well as other works focused on aspects of the spiritual life. A Sister of St. Therese, Servant of God, Leone Martin, Bearer of Hope, with Father Timothy Gallagher. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. What is happening in the world at this point? Is this is World War II taking place? I mean, is France occupied yet, or is it on the? On yes, the thank east? you. That's that's helpful okay. to do that. So this is in 1932. So this, these are the years of Hitler's rise, and uh, they're well aware of all of this happening. These are also the years in which the war will take place in Spain, and so many priests and religious will be put to death. Some of their own visitation sisters. And they're very aware of all of this and praying for them. She's also very aware of the secularizing uh, trends going on in, in society. We'll see a few echoes of this in some of the letters. But yeah, this is, this is the time when things are on the march toward what will become World War II. They're very aware of this. This next letter will give us a further perspective on the physical sufferings that uh, she underwent and some of the health issues that uh, she had to carry. So she is 69 years old at this point. She is writing to her sister Marie, who is the eldest. Marie, who is 72 at this point. Marie, in the last years of her life, had uh, great suffering from physical reasons. She was unable to walk uh, in the last years of her life and underwent a lot of pain. So Leonie is writing to her, aware that her sister is uh, in this physical condition. My beloved eldest sister... It is from a reclining chair that I'm writing to wish you a happy feast day. So, like you, I'm unable to walk right now. Even so, I consider I'm very fortunate not to be in bed, as I was for four days. So here I am, now lame too. That's one more thing we have in common, darling sister. But the difference is that my cross is made of straw compared to yours. Yet, fortunately for poor little me, the important thing is to suffer generously and patiently which I'm trying to do with the grace of God. So she's had a surgery on her knee. My right knee has been playing tricks on me for 33 years, and eventually the inevitable catastrophe struck. It needed to be cut open right to the kneecap. I just wince, as I say, whenever I hear about the medical procedures at the time. It's been a week since the operation took place. There's a gaping wound, and it should heal on its own, but it will take at least six weeks. Let me quickly reassure you by saying that the suffering I've been enduring is nothing in comparison to the torture, so that's the word she uses, I had to go through when my ingrown toenails were torn off on both feet. Then the plasters, so those are these poultices that we mentioned, were extremely painful, and the ones on my knees are nothing in comparison. I'm in hardly any pain now. What frustrates me the most is knowing I won't be able to say the mass responses for a long time because my knee will take months to recover. Apparently, as best I understand this, by turns, the sisters would be assigned to say out loud the responses to the priest, the people at that time before the council didn't. And she always loved this. It was considered a special privilege when you were closer to the priest and you participated in the mass in that more direct way way, and she loved this whenever she had the chance to do this. Uh, What burdens her even more than the physical suffering right now is that it's going to be months before she'll be able to do it again when her knee is healed enough so that she can do it. I say fiat. My little companion and my nurse, Sister Marguerite Agnes and dear Didine, join me in wishing you a very happy feast day. The two little visitation sisters will take communion for you. As I mentioned earlier, I think This was their gift to each other on feast days and birthdays, that they would, basically, they were giving Jesus to the person, and there was no better gift they could give. I will be 69 years old on the Feast of the Sacred Heart. I assure you, 
It's a sorry sight to see five of us going to Holy Communion in wheelchairs. It's never been seen before. But blessed be these wheelchairs, because they allow us to go and meet our beloved. Without him, we wouldn't be able to live, let alone suffer. Yes, we are certainly being repaid a hundredfold here below. You get glimpses in these letters of how central the Eucharist was for her. From your little sister who cherishes you and our two little sisters, Sister Francoise Therese. This next letter shows us Leonie at 70. I'm basically choosing letters that exemplify things that return many times in these letters. It exemplifies that intense desire for heaven that never leaves Leonie's heart. Whether we could all live like that, you know, she's, I, I, would, I think I said earlier, she's really taught me that, uh, to become much more aware of the fact that we are passing. We know it, but to see someone live it like this so vividly you know, awakens its consciousness in us as well. So she's writing to her three sisters, dear little sisters. Here we are, reunited far from our homeland once more. Now, the pause every year in the writing the letters was during Advent and Lent. They didn't write any letters. So you'll get these Christmas letters and Easter letters when they can communicate again, and that's what you have here. So reunited again in the sense that we can communicate again now. When will we at last leave this exile and go to contemplate the face of our risen beloved? My wings are more and more restless. I can't help it, despite being very resigned to stay on earth as long as God wishes. Above all, it is what he does that I love, and I tell him over and over that I need his own love to love him. I can't do it. I need your love to help me love you. You can hear the echoes of Therese in this. Only then do I find rest and patiently wait for the eternal reunion in the heavens. You know, this too is something that at points I would stop in reading through the letters, especially in these latter years of her life. And I'd say, what kind of person writes this way, writes this kind of, has these kinds of thoughts? And you can see why a cause of canonization has been introduced. And now some uh, very telling remarks about this exchange of letters, which has been going on now, well, for uh, 34 years at this point. Give me your news quickly. So Lent is over. You can write. Don't, don't hesitate. Give me your news quickly. It's the only thing that helps me bear exile. It's a very striking sentence. These letters were a lifeline for her. Uh, she needed them. The sisters knew it. They meant everything to her. It's the only thing that helps me bear exile. Second to my daily communion, which is the real center, your letters bring me matchless reassurance. Like you, beloved little sisters, all that passes away hardly affects me anymore. Our souls are hungry for God, which is a grace that by far exceeds all others. All right, well, this uh, this next letter takes us to a year later. This is 1934. And the background to um, Leonie is writing again to her eldest sister, Marie who is 74 at this point. And uh, Pauline has just celebrated the golden anniversary of her vows, 50 years of vows. So that's kind of a background to what's happening here. The reason I quote this letter is because this is an example of this endless gratitude in Leonie. This just gives us a chance to touch it. Dearly beloved eldest sister, thank you for your kind letter. Once again, it proved how much motherly affection and boundless devotion you have for your little visitation sister. So this is where it starts. Thank you. It shows how much affection and boundless devotion you have for me. So that's the tone right from the start is gratitude. I was indeed hoping to hear about the 8th of May, which was the anniversary, 50 years, that ineffable and heavenly feast day on earth. The community and I are already in awe of the delightful poem that my little sister friend, Marie of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to guess this is one of the Carmelite sisters whom she would have met in her visit there, uh, illustrated. I am overjoyed to see that her eyes must have recovered, for she would be unable to produce such marvels otherwise. This is another thing that you see as the years go by in Leonie, which you do not see, or only rarely in those first years. I've mentioned how completely other-centered Zeli and Therese are. You see this growing in Leonie as the years go by. So here, she delights, not simply because they've 
received a very beautifully illustrated poem. But because the fact that the sister was able to illustrate it tells her that her eyes are better, and that just gives her joy to know that. What bliss it is to possess a portrait of my darling little mama for her golden anniversary. So they would take photographs and send them to uh, Leonie and the community there at the visitation. She really hasn't aged, which is a very pleasant surprise. In fact, if you see photographs of Pauline, she does conserve that same appearance for many years in her life. I would like a copy of this portrait sent to the Holy Father. All right. So that's that little touch of sort of gauche. Uh, you know, I, she's so enthused about it that the Holy Father should have this too. Our chaplain was very happy to grant your request and celebrate Mass for our dear jubilarian. He very thoughtfully asked me to say the Mass responses. And that's again what, what I men mentioned, which means so much to her. You can understand my joy to have played such an important role. I was very moved, as anyone would be. The priest was very touched by your generous donation. He thanks you warmly. So thus far, this has been pure gratitude, pure pouring out of thanks. You didn't answer us as to whether two masses could be said in your chapel on July 2nd in honor of our dear and reverend jubilarians, and her, herself, obviously, too. I mean, it's her own anniversary. Um, but this would be the celebration of their own jubilarians. Our two former superiors, can we count on them taking place? We desire them very much, as does Mrs. Lecour, who would have requested, uh, who should have requested you for them, or will do so shortly. It was most thoughtful of His Excellency, the Bishop of Sayez, so again, thoughtful, great gratitude, to ask for a collection to be taken in all the churches and chapels in his diocese for our Saints Basilica. These were the years in which they were building that huge basilica to St. Therese, which you have at least here, and which was dedicated in 1937. So this is 1934. So they're in the, in the thick of the process of building it. And to raise funds for it, um, to help with this, the bishop has a collection taken in all the churches of his diocese. The speech that our holy bishop delivered at the Carmel is altogether beautiful and of exquisite finesse. Perhaps that speech was for... Pauline's 50th anniversary. Happy and holy feast day to dear little sister Marie of the Trinity, that's Therese Navis. In the communion that I'm intending to take for you, our beloved Jesus will convey all my religious and sisterly affection to you. It was on this feast day, 59 years ago, so the Holy Trinity, that I received the heaven-sent bread of life. I mentioned before this uh, tenacious memory for dates and anniversaries that Leonie always evidences. In fact, she had a remarkable memory. And so at times when the sisters want to remember details of the family life, maybe for something they're writing, you see them write to her and say, can you remember how she, Therese, was dressed on this occasion or things of that sort? Uh, they all knew that she would remember these details better than the rest of them. Farewell, beloved little sisters. And once again, thank you a hundred thousand times. You make me so happy. So that letter is, as they say, it's just pure gratitude. There are a number of points in Leonie's letters in which she speaks of the similarity that she discovers, more than similarity and identity, between the founder of her own community, St. Francis de Sales, and then the spirituality of St. Therese, as Leonie learns more and more about it. There's a gentleness in both. There's a, a littleness in both. There's an avoiding of the extraordinary in both. There's a focusing on the small actions of every day in both. There's a deep sense of the path of holiness consisting in the duties of one state of life. There's a focus on a simplicity and a warmth and a gentleness that things don't need to be difficult and hard and complicated. Of course, there in both, there's a deep love for Jesus, a profound sense of prayer, all the fundamentals, the Eucharist, you know, Mary, there's a profound sense of the fundamentals. But Leonie delights in seeing the identity almost, more than, as I say, certainly similarity, but more than that, in the two sources of her spiritual life. So, as she lives in the visitation at meals, you know, they're doing readings. And of course, they're reading the writings of Francis de Sales. She'll mention the introduction to the devout life. 
probably also his treatise on the love of God, his letters, the correspondence. He seems to focus a little bit less on the writings of St. Jean de Chantal, but she's very well aware of them. And then a deep love for St. Margaret Mary Alacoque and the Sacred Heart. And again, there it is again, that approachable, loving, non-judgmental and condemning God that who so desire opens his heart so that we can enter there. So she finds a great ease and commonality between these two spiritualities reflected in the name, precisely the name that she took, Francis and Therese. And that's throughout her life that she'll always live that. You know, Father Dolan asks her, are you disappointed that you didn't become a Carmel? And she answers, no, because this is where God called me. And this is where I'm at home and what I want to live. She would have never survived in the Carmel. Even physically, her health uh, would, would never have endured in the Carmel. And she will say at, at one point in her letters, she'll say, what would have become of us, meaning herself and the other visitation sisters, if Francis de Sales had not founded the visitation monastery? Because this is a place where we can become religious. This is a place where people like us, with these struggles and limitations, can live a life of consecration to God. And she was so grateful to Francis de Sales and St. John de Chantal for having created the place where she was able to live religious life. I'd say there's a deep unity and commonality there, as I've said. I think that's quite remarkable because when you think about it, Therese is a Carmelite sister. And what her little way, it has elements, yes, that is gleaned from the Carmelite life. It's a new thing. And it speaks to those who are outside of the Carmel and who are not necessarily versed in contemplative prayer. And I think that's why she was elevated, was she not? Because it was for the every person. And that is in the same lane as uh, the teachings of Francis de Sales, is it not? In fact, sometimes when you read Francis de Sales or Therese, it'd be hard to know which saint actually is speaking. That's a good observation. Yes, Mm -hmm. there is that difference in Therese, if you compare her with uh, Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross, from whom she learned very deeply, certainly. But what she's doing, uh, St. John Paul II uh, said this, I think, really well when he said that basically Therese's teaching is a rediscovery of something that was in the gospel. It, It was there. She didn't create something new, but she brought to the fore something which had been marginalized. And that is uh, this this little way, this the the love in, in our God, how he touches with infinite mercy our weakness and an approach which banishes the fear and the unhappy sense of having to settle for less when we see our own failings and so forth. And those very failings become the space, actually, of our hope, because more than anything else, as Therese says, when we open them to, to Jesus, they draw upon us his infinite mercy and his infinite love. So she's really just uh, reawakening something that's in the gospel, but presenting it in a way that is fresh and vigorous and new, and to which we respond by saying, I can do that for all of us. Yeah, I think a lot of times when, I know I did when I first read about the life of Therese many decades ago, what I heard was this young 20-year-old girl, and would die, of course, so young, I would sometimes say to myself, boy, it was, and I mean this, and i a shame of my thoughts at the time, but, well, it's easy for her to write. She died young. She didn't have to live through the travails of life. Could she have endured it all the way through? And yet I see her sister, who went through all the things she did. Yes, this does work. When you see it in the life of this, what the 70-year-old woman, yes. Yeah, it does work. <laughs> it absolutely does. It's so apropos. And, and I think that might be the experience of a lot of people when they hear Therese at first blush. And maybe it's given with time, we begin to see that she was absolutely right. But the gift of her sister, really, along with all the others who have been wonderful devotees of Therese, whether it be Dorothy Day or, you know, a doctor like Adrienne von Speyer working in, in Switzerland who was so enthralled by her, or even someone like John Paul and Mother Teresa and all so many others. But how wonderful that it, it could also be exemplified by the life of her mm-hmm. own sister. And by somebody who was her very sister, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that leads us very 
appropriately into the next letter that I want to quote here because it's precisely on this very point of the little way. And this is Leonie at 71. This also gives us an insight into these annual retreats that she made. Darling little sisters, our retreat is over. On the evening of Tuesday, October 9th, I came from it feeling completely renewed. That's an interesting insight, parenthetically, into the place of retreats in our lives. We all need them. And that's why in the church's tradition, annual retreats have always been recognized as a very valuable practice. The retreats can jumpstart a spiritual life, can give it a new impulse periodically. My enclosed resolutions, so she, she always does this or often does this, she'll copy out her retreat resolutions and send them to her sisters, especially to her sister Pauline, whom she wants as her mother and kind of guide she wants to know, she wants to share this with. God was so gracious to me. I think he is waiting for me to have this attitude of radical humility before coming to steal me away, which is extremely encouraging and gives me wings. Do pray hard for me so that I might persevere. Nothing strengthens the soul quite like faithfulness. I'm having the pleasure of experiencing this. Jesus is carrying his tiny little child because he knows that even though she is making progress, so Leonie is aware of this, he is holding her by the hand uh, uh, that even though she is making progress and he is holding her by the hand, she will fall flat on her face that is left to herself. I therefore have everything to gain from staying in his divine arms and I'm being careful to avoid trying to grow up. Interesting thing, that to grow and to remain small at the same time. Here are her retreat resolutions. And let's note that this is a 71-year-old woman who is striving to grow in this way. God has had me see as clear as a day that I must continue to embrace my insignificance. So that inferiority, which was such a source of pain for her, for so long now is something that she wants to embrace. He wants me to love my lowliness and utter powerlessness. Love. Not only recognize, accept, bear with, but even to love it. Why? He wants me to love my lowliness and utter powerlessness. And the truth of it is that every one of us can say this. It's just as I said before, just as, let's say, St. Maximilian Kolbe shows us powerfully clearly what it means to lay down one's life for one's brother. Therese shows us what the gospel teaching about being poor in spirit, for example, really means. She shows it to us in such relief. He wants wants me to love my lowliness and utter powerlessness, so I must be happy to be insignificant and considered as such, despite the resistance of my pride. She has a humanity. This is entirely easy. Therefore, I no longer want to put myself first under any pretext. This could be Therese writing at this point. But henceforth, joyfully or joylessly, it matters little, lead a life that is completely hidden and insignificant in the eyes of creatures. I adopt these words that my holy little sister pronounced, and they, I quietly trust, will help me significantly. I mentioned this earlier. So she quotes from Therese, O Jesus, How I wish I could tell all little souls how ineffable is your condescension. I feel were it not impossible, because Therese sees herself as the most, as the least and most insignificant, that if you found a soul weaker than mine, it would please you to fill it with still greater favors, provided it abandoned itself with complete confidence to your infinite mercy. And that's the key. We don't remain locked up in our awareness or our limitations, but we bring them with great confidence to Jesus. This is something that, as I've gotten to know Leonie, probably this personally more than anything else, I really pray for to really get a hold of this because there is such freedom. Then our limitations don't weigh on us anymore. And then how well things we do are going to turn out don't depend on us anymore. Of course, we have to make our effort. But it's primarily uh, um, much more the outpouring of the Lord's love and grace on which we depend. And when we do that, we fly in this life. Uh, That's how Therese says, confidence works miracles. And this is what she's talking about. Provided it abandoned itself with complete confidence to your infinite mercy. So this is what Therese says. It's impossible, but if God could find a soul even weaker than mine, he would do even greater works in it. And so Leonie now says, 
And so, Jesus, here is this tiny soul. You found one. I'm even more insignificant, inferior, less capable, poorer than Therese. You couldn't find a poorer or weaker one than mine. I therefore have every right to hope to surrender, that's the abandon, surrender myself to your merciful love. Doing so will help me triumph over my foolish pride and faithfully keep my resolution. O my God, in my life you have put little of what shines. Grant that, like you, I might go toward authentic values, disdaining human values, in order to esteem and will only the absolute, the eternal, the love of God by dint of hope. That last sentence is taken from something said by one of their retreat directors uh, in the visitation. Now, what I think is touched here, and to my mind, this is the real true deep center of Leonie's path to holiness, that her weakness and very real limitations on every level of her being, which made her inferior to others in every human estimation, recognized slowly, painfully, gradually, increasingly over the years, accepted, and then even loved, because brought to Jesus with, with total confidence that he can take this and do wonderful works of grace with this, uh, that's what moves her out of that situation of being locked into inferiority and into the kind of warmth and peace and joy that we've seen people note in her. And that became her qualifying traits in these last decades of her life. Biblically, what this is, to my mind, is the first beatitude lived in one of the most powerful instances of it we'll ever see in our spiritual tradition. Blessed are the poor in spirit, who know that they can't depend on themselves, and therefore depend utterly on God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It is also one of the most beautiful, powerful, lived illustrations I think we will ever witness of Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 12, I will boast gladly of my weakness. And this is what Leonie is doing at this stage. And I, I rejoice in it. I will boast gladly of my weakness that the power of Christ may dwell in me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And that's the paradox that uh, just launches Leonie into a life of love and holiness and union with the Lord that is still obviously bearing wonderful fruit in the church today. You've been listening to A Sister of St. Therese, Servant of God, Leone Martin, Bearer of Hope, with Father Timothy Gallagher. To hear and or to download this episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it on the Discerning Hearts free app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts in cooperation with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for A Sister of St. Therese, Servant of God, Leonie Martin, Bearer of Hope with Father Timothy Gallagher.